The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. everybody okay. and welcome to Autism Live. It's April. It's Autism Awareness, Autism Acceptance, Autism Appreciation, Autism Action Month. We're here with Dr. Temple Grandin and we're wishing her a good morning. I want everybody to know we're pre-taping this. Uh, this When this airs, it'll be a week later. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, because this was the only time we could get you because you're very busy this month. No, we yeah. have. I'm doing lots and lots and lots of travel. That's what I've been doing. Absolutely. And talking to people, you're a busy career woman and you've been talking to people and you've got a new book that just came out the other day, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Uh, so you've been jetting here, there, and everywhere. We're so grateful that you had the time to be with us this morning. Yeah. Uh, first of all, just general, how are you doing? Well, I've been doing just fine. Lots of travel and i uh, I was just out at a cattle meeting. It was really a great cattle meeting because I was talking to students. And I really like talking to students because I like to help young people to get into good careers. And and I tell students, get out and do lots of things. Yeah. Do career-relevant internships, career-relevant jobs when you're in college. Um, volunteer to help professors with the projects so you can try on lots of different things. Find out what you like. You also need to find out, yeah, I tried that and hated it. Because you don't want to end up getting a degree in something that you find out you hate. Yeah, that would that would be a bummer. And people have yeah, done that, <laughs> right? Uh, um, there were I, originally when we set this interview, I thought we were going to be talking about different kinds of minds, which I definitely want to talk about. But then you've got a new edition of your book, Developing Talents. Uh, subtitled Careers for Individuals with Autism. I want to talk about both of those. And I do have some questions that some folks have written in. Um, but maybe first we start with different kinds of minds. Um, and I know you you usually have your books there. Do you have a copy of that? Yeah, it's right have? here. I've got, this is, um, this is the different kinds of minds. And this is the young reader's version of my book, Visual Thinking. Yeah. And... And so I had to cut down the reference list. Um, I cut out a lot of school policy stuff in there, but I kept all of the material in there on the different kinds of thinkers, the object visualizer like me, the mathematical pattern thinker, and the word thinker, because that's some of the most important stuff. I did not cut those references out. And it's basically an abridged version of the other book. And if you read it, you know, adults have bought it, even though it's officially a young reader's version and for like middle school, yeah, you still would get the same basic ideas. And some people would prefer to read a shorter version. <laughs> well, and, I, and what I read uh, about it, um, it, it's very accessible and it, it's for readers, probably grade three through eight ideal, which. Well, actually it's, it's, yeah, it's actually aimed at middle school. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, that, that's a pretty grown-up level of reading. Yeah. You know, I think the best way to describe it is an abridged version of the other book, Visual Thinking, and all the important ideas are in there. Well, okay, like I might, I, you know, I have examples in the book of different people that were different kinds of thinkers. Well, I had to take some of those out. You know, I might have three examples instead of five. There you go. But I love this because and some of this goes back to your original TED Talk, too. And I remember watching that TED Talk, and for, for me as a parent, it helped me to look at my son in a, in a different way where I could meet him where he was because I realized my mind works differently than his. And I don't think I realized that before I heard you speak, Temple. It was huge. It was absolutely Well, this is huge. really important because I thought, when I was young, I thought everybody was a visual thinker like me who thought in pictures. And the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, shows exactly how I think. That part of the movie is super accurate. And and that I didn't know that other people thought verbally until I was in my late 30s. And the first step is realizing that people think differently. And I was just doing another interview, and we talked about um, how we need these different kinds of thinkers for problem solving. Yes. We have different approaches to problem solving. Yes. 
Yes, I, re I remember one of the first times we interviewed you, you talked about the Fukushima uh, plant. And, yeah. and, if, and if we had had a brain like yours on that plant, it would never have happened. No, we would have had watertight doors on. Yeah. You see, the mathematician doesn't see it. In fact, just a week ago, I was on a plane, and I got to talking to the passenger beside me, and she was a real mathematical engineer that did costing on all kinds of stuff. And we talked about Fukushima. And I said, would you have seen the water going in there, going over the seawall, flooding the basement, and drowning the electrical emergency cooling pump? And she said, no, I would not have seen it. Yeah. You know, that's why you need to have some experienced people on the job that had experienced flooding. Well, and that's why we need diversity, right? That's uh, right. That's why you need the different kinds of minds. Yes, You need absolutely. different kinds of minds. Um, so that someone says, hey, we better put watertight doors on this. I looked up the historical data, and that that's a 10-meter seawall, just over 30-foot-high seawall. It's going to be breached. Yeah, of course. I mean, um, but there, there's our case for diversity. So different uh, kinds of minds. Great book for those of you who are looking for a gift for your middle schoolers. But it's a great book for parents to be reading, very accessible to understand that how you look at the world isn't necessarily how your child looks at the world. Yeah. But, but I especially love it because it is so empowering for young people on the spectrum to understand that the way that their mind works is a value. That's right. No, and I, I would totally agree with that. Yes. And we need the different kinds of minds, and I'm concerned that the object visualizers are getting screened out because they're taking hands-on classes out of the schools. I was just talking to mom. And I um, know they're going to take music and art out of their school, and she's going to have to find – she's looking for another school right now. Yeah. Yeah, well, in very few schools – I mean, some of them are starting to put shop They're back starting in. to put it back. Some yeah. places are starting to put those things back. Yes. And But, you see, the visual thinking is a different kind of problem solving the math, than the mathematical thinking. So you take something like a food processing plant, for example. The visual thinkers invent the packaging equipment. Well, I'll call that the clever engineering department. The degreed engineer does boilers, refrigeration, uh, wind loading, power, water requirements, the things that require mathematics. You see, you need to have both. Yes. Yes, that's the thing. I think that's the ticket. we got to be reminding everybody it takes all kinds of minds. So um, recently, though, you, in fact, just uh, on the 2nd of April, you're the newest addition of Developing Talents, Careers for Individuals with Autism came out. That's from Future Horizons. We want to give a shout out to our friends at Future Horizons. So my first question for you about that is who is the, uh, if the if the other book is for middle schoolers, who's the ideal, this book ideal for? Well, I think parents, um, because where I'm really seeing a problem is we're doing a good job with little kids. I'm not saying every place is doing a good job, but overall, we're doing a much better job with little kids, with early intervention, than we are with uh, making the transition to adulthood. Yeah. I'm seeing way too much where the parents uh, do everything for the fully verbal child. They're not learning shopping. They're not learning life skills. Um, I want to start uh, start working on, uh, on, on doing jobs outside the home around 11, maybe church volunteer jobs, dog walking for the neighbors. I talked to a parent yesterday. And uh, the grandfather needed some help uh, after he had back surgery. So the 11-year-old's going over to the grandpa's house and uh, helping him with the lawn. And, you know, these are what I'm going to call the paper route substitutes because it's important that they learn how to do a task on a schedule outside the home where somebody that's not mom or dad is the boss. And the instant they're legal, I told another parent yesterday at this conference, that um, they need to get their kid a job. And I think in a lot of cases, we need to just uh, forget the interviews, go in the back door, just figure out something in the neighborhood. And I do warn right in the beginning of the Developing Talents book, let's avoid the chaotic multitasking chaos at the takeout window. And the other thing that's going to save a lot of jobs wherever there's a sequence of events, like closing out a cash register, is pilot's checklists. Step one, step two, step three, for closing out the cash register or opening up the cash register in the morning. Give them checklists because um, if you just yak it to me, I cannot remember the, the sequence. Yeah. 
having some checklists helps save a lot of jobs. A lot of jobs. This has come up over and over and over again. And there's two kinds of places where they need a checklist. Something you do every day, like the cash register, and then maybe in a few weeks they can forget the checklist. But then you have other jobs where you're doing something new each day. Mm. And two apprentice electrician jobs were lost because the boss went yak, 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 and the wrong light switches were installed in the wrong place and the wrong ceiling fixture got installed in the wrong place and the, and the person was fired. Yeah. They had just taken two minutes to write it down. Yeah. Would have well, saved that job. I love this book for so many different reasons, but, uh, you know, because there's so many things that you guys cover in, in the book, um, but certainly one of them is that, you know, it's not just getting the job, it's keeping the job. And there are so many instances where people lose the job and that's demoralizing. Uh, for anybody who's ever lost a job and been fired, that's demoralizing. We want to set up our young adults for success. Um, well, the first thing is they got to get there on time. Yes. And another thing is the hygiene. That one's non-negotiable. You got to clean it up. And there's a scene in the HBO movie where the boss slammed down the deodorant. And that actually happened. Yeah. No, you've got to clean it up. Do you? That, I'm you dress eccentric, but you cannot be a filthy, dirty slob. But I'm wondering, had your mother said things to you before, or was she just not staying off of you for that? No, she got on that. So um, why, what, I'm wondering, as a mom, is it that it's easier to hear that from someone else than it is from mom? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. You see, this is why they need to start getting experience with, with, with people outside the family, because that was the boss that did that. It wasn't, yeah. um, wasn't family. Sometimes it's easier. And, and the way you deal with some of these things is you tell them what they should do. And the secretaries took me shopping. That actually happened. And, and there's some, you know, you get into all the controversy about masking, but there's some stuff where you just have to conform some. Yeah. And, and where, uh, I'd have a hard time, fast chit chat conversations. I can't follow them. There's kind of rhythmic chit chat conversations of people laughing kind of rhythmically. I can't follow that. My processor speed's too slow. I find that kind of stuff a total bore, too. Well, I was going to say, I, you and I have talked about this before, that, you know, that small talk kind of thing. You've said to me, it's just boring. It's just boring. Um, yeah. That, and I I think it's boring to everybody, but we just, you know, yeah. uh, we don't know what else to say. And we our, our minds aren't thinking the things that you're thinking. Um, but I'm curious, one of the things you say in the book is that, one of the things that they need to learn is to care about what the company cares about. That's right. And yeah, that that's, that's not automatic. Right. So how do you teach that? Well, they have to do something that somebody else wants. They've got to learn how to do something that somebody wants. How did you learn that? Well, I just learned uh, – one thing I learned – uh, when I was in high school, I had a little sign painting business, and my first sign job was for a hair salon. I had to paint a sign that they would want, and it wouldn't have cattle or uh, flying saucers on it. <laughs> Is that what you would have put on it, cattle and flying saucers? Oh, I knew the client wouldn't want that. Yeah. Um, but for – for because parents are reading this. I think employers should read this, and I think adults on the spectrum should read this too. Um, what are there things that you can think of that a parent can do to help build that skill to well, realize that's ideally what I'd like to do Yeah, is around 11 years old. I want to start things like church volunteer jobs, walking the neighbor's dog, not their own dog. The neighbor's dog needs to be outside the family, helping an older person, not, you know, clean their house, something. And then instant their legal age, they need to get jobs. I'm realizing that we, we kind of have lost this in our society. I remember that my mom, when I was 11, she talked to the lady next door. There was an elderly, elderly lady next door, and she said, do you need some help around the house? And my 11-year-old daughter needs something to do. So the next thing I knew, I was over there polishing her silver. Um, and I had to learn how to do that. That wasn't a skill that I had. But I think we don't do that anymore. I don't think we connect think, with the neighbors and I say. Think we need to be doing that. When I was 13, mother just went into a, 
went up to a lady that did uh, dressmaking out of her home. She mainly altered dresses and offered up my services. And then two afternoons a week in the summer, I took apart dresses and I hand hemmed them for her. That's that was the same kind of thing. She just did it in the neighborhood. Yeah. To so, learn some job skills. So as parents, we need to reach out to the people in the neighborhood and try to job our kids out a little bit. But let That's me ask right. you this. Do they need to get paid? Uh, well, what happened with the seamstress in the beginning, she offered up my services for free. And then she liked my sewing so much, she started to pay me. There we go. There we go. Uh, you know, okay, church volunteer job, you wouldn't be paid. But the dog walking, you probably need to pay him a little something. That's not big much, but... Yeah. You know, uh, and then the instant they're legal age in Colorado, it's 14 for safe retail. Let's get a real job. Yeah. And some of this interview stuff, let's just kind of avoid that and just get them in the back door. They um, just find something and then some shop in the neighborhood they can work in. Yeah. So what, ideally what I want is a slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. Ideally, I'd like two decent summer jobs under that belt before they graduate. I but again, that. I want to emphasize it's never too late. Yes. I love I'm that. Seeing, it's never too late, but I've seen adults graduating from college, magna cum laude, lose it in the workplace. I just heard about one yesterday. Mm. Never had any job experience until they, no, that's just too sudden. Yeah. You know, when I talked to, to an autistic person, he was like a junior in college. I said, you need to get a summer job this summer. Yeah. You've got to learn some work skills. And when I was in college, I had an internship at a research lab. And I also had my mother set up one where I was an aide for an autistic kid at a summer program. How amazing is so that? So I had, had, you know, job, got job experience. Really, really important. But what I'm hearing is your mom went ahead and set it up. Yeah, she did. Uh, so that's that's a note that we all need to take. But I need a lot of moms are overprotecting, and uh, they come up to me at the book table, and here's it's a teenager. Yeah. Well, he should come up and ask for the book to be signed. Yeah. Not mom talking for him. Or we're at the meeting and they raise their hand and mom's doing the talk and I said, no, you, your son needs to take the microphone and, and talk to the whole group, yeah. and I've gotten them to do it. Yes. Well, you know I'm guilty of this and that you have helped me with that. Uh, I want to know. I want to know, though. In the book, you say that there is a big difference between academic and job skills. Academic skills yes. and job skills different. I think, of course, we want people to buy the book, and you guys can get it at every major bookseller. It's available on Future Horizons, and it came out on the second of April. But talk to us a little bit about so that we have an understanding, Dr. Granin, about because I think parents are so concerned about academics, they're missing it. Well, I think they get – academics is important, but I'm seeing too many students that excel academically. I just heard another sad story yesterday. Oh, super brilliant, straight A's, all of this, and cannot handle the workplace and never had any any experience in the workplace uh, until they tried their first job after high school or after college. No, we need to be um, – well, you have to be on time. You have to do what the boss wants. And the other thing is, in any job, there's going to be some, like, I call it grunt work. When I worked for the magazine, and that's a job I got for myself, is that scene where I walk up and I get the card. And, and being coming a journalist was really important, helping my career. But there's the fun stuff, like writing feature articles. But then I have to write up show and sale results. Yeah. All the champion bulls at the Arizona Stock Show. And that's not fun. But it's work that has to be done. Every job has a certain amount of that stuff. Every job place has a certain amount of stuff that goes wrong at it. You said you just have to sort of weigh it on the scales of justice. Hopefully the good points outweigh the bad points. But you and also you talk have to tolerate a certain amount of stuff went wrong on a job. You also talk about though the shift that comes if you get a new boss. And that at oh, that, that job that is a real danger area. Yeah. And I almost lost my journalism job. When the magazine was sold and I got a new boss, and he thought I was weird. And Susie, the nice lady who laid out the ads, and I'm pretty sure she was on the spectrum, she says, the new boss doesn't like you. We've got to get a great big portfolio together of all of your articles in this big scrapbook and show it to Jim. 
I didn't recognize the warning signs. I would have been let go. So but I put all my articles in this big, thick scrapbook like this, and he gave me a raise. That's amazing. And is that partly why you recommend that everybody have a portfolio now? Well, you always want to um, see, well, since I was writing, you see, you have a portfolio of work you could show. You know, I'd been working for that magazine for like three years. Yeah. So I had a good portfolio of stuff I could show him. But that's and vital that, in other well, careers, too, having a portfolio. Yeah, well, I'm a big believer in portfolios. I'm a big, that's how I got livestock design jobs, is I would show people my drawings. Like, here's an example of one of my drawings right here, out of the book oh. Thinking in Pictures. And I would show people my drawings. That's showing a portfolio. Yeah. Well, that, and, that what that drawing says to all of us, Dr. Grannon, is, oh, my gosh, talent. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Is showing off the drawings. But I didn't recognize the new boss thought I was weird and didn't like me. But Susie, the person who did the advertising layout, did. And she says, we've got to get a portfolio together of all your work. But if she hadn't done that, I would have lost that job. Did it – this is a, a weird question, but how did it feel? Because our kids get called weird on a regular basis. How did that feel for you, and how did you work through – Whatever that was, aside from. I just got just, the portfolio together and I. It didn't you know, hurt your I feelings. I still have the portfolio. It's about that, was about that thick. But it didn't hurt your feelings, Temple? I just wanted to get it together and not lose the job. Okay. You focused. You focused yeah, on I focused on needed. doing that. And I got all the stuff together and pasted the articles in uh, on the pages. And, and you did that by yourself. Yeah, I, I put the portfolio together, yes. Amazing. Yeah, she didn't do that. She yeah. just told me that I needed to do that. Yeah. Um, and had you already had practice doing that kind of stuff, or you you just were good at she it? She told me I, just, we, I needed to get a portfolio together, so I got a nice notebook cover, and I cut articles out of back issues of the magazines and pasted them on the pages. Amazing. So that all of my work, starting with my first article up to the present, were in this big scrapbook. Then I had a nice notebook cover on. Which and then I saw you know, the ad layout stuff that, you know, we had old-fashioned ad layout stuff and put it on the cover. And nowadays they can do digital portfolios, and I, I swear, I think our kids understand how to do that easier than the parents do. Um, well, then they need to be doing it. Yes, and exactly. And it be easier. I mean, I was cutting articles out of back issues and pasting them on pages. To Which, make the portfolio. No, I made the portfolio after she told me to do it. I I think that portfolio needs to be in a glass case somewhere in a museum. I uh, actually know. have it in a chest in my living room. I, but I think at some point it needs to be preserved. And I used the wrong kind of glue <laughs> and it messed up all the articles. Oh, dear. But was that I later? Didn't or at the I didn't know. You didn't know. Uh, one of the things that you talk about in the book is making changes slowly. I want you to talk with our parents a, a little bit about why that's the thing that makes sense. Sudden things are hard. You know, slow transition. We start out, I did 11, you're walking the neighbor's dog. Maybe doing some other little thing in the neighborhood. I, I talked to a 12-year-old. She was the church coffee lady and very proud of it. Yeah, this was just a year ago. This was recent. And that's just, you know, specific examples of the kinds of things you could do. And then the instant they're legal, they need to get real jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, one of the things that sort of surprised me, I have to say, that you recommended for people who are going to college, maybe not going to college full-time to begin with, but going part-time and having a job at the same time. Talk to me a little bit about that, why you recommend Well, I, that. Wanted, I want to make a gradual transition from the world of school to the world of work. Now, I did take a full load in college, and then the summers I took off. Yeah. So that's when I did the jobs. But I also did some sign painting and some carpentry work on the side even when I was in college. Yeah, you. I think you were always busy. And I always but wonder. I think that other people, you know, maybe take a little lighter load, yeah. um, but at least get summer jobs. Yes. Yes, and, and it's that time of year right now. 
the the parents need to be out there beating the bushes trying to find who might be looking for somebody. Um, and I want to avoid rapid multitasking chaos yeah. at a takeout window, the super busy McDonald's or something like that. And I also want to avoid the chaos in the stores at Christmas time. Yeah. That's not the time to start a job. And there's been really bad failures with those things. It's you interesting. You know, find something that's quieter. Um, now, let's say it is fast food. We'll then work an easier shift where it's not so busy. Yeah. I, I really that, was thinking about this this week, Dr. Granite, because my son's about to turn 21. And I've been saying for a year, he's very interested in mixology. He's going. He's a junior in college studying screenwriting, but he's very interested in mixology. And I was thinking for his 21st birthday of getting him a class where he learns how to be a bartender. Um, but then, and then I'm thinking that's a very chaotic scenario. But of course, once he learns it, now, he doesn't. Why, why a bartender? Why did you pick that? Because he he's very interested in mixology. He he already mixes. Oh, mixology. mixology. I thought you said mythology. No, mixology. Okay, he, all right. He likes to mix things. I don't know that he would ever be a bartender. Uh, so, but but why, was, why is he interested in that? How did that get started? Well, I don't I don't know how it got. started started i i don't remember what the impetus for i think maybe it was because we got a uh, we were having a harry potter party that's what it was where oh, everything okay. at the party was going to be harry potter stuff and we found a book of drinks that would be harry potter drinks oh okay All and right. so then so then he was interested in that and he started looking up other things like how to make a smoked drink and how to stamp ice cubes. He got really into the fancy schmancy kinds of things for bartending. Well, he ought to be working at a fancy restaurant doing it, not not a bar. Well, but I, I just, I'm wondering if I should get him the bartending class. Now, he's going to school for screenwriting, which is, and, he, and he's a writer, but just as a, a another skill. You know, since he was interested in it. Well, I think that might be a good idea because I the hands-on classes are not going to get replaced by artificial intelligence. There you go. And I'm really concerned about this. So I'm going to really push something. Bartenders are not going away. And people who mix fancy drinks, um, you know, real high-end places, that's not going to go away. Well, maybe I'll maybe I'll do that. But you know, what he, I... needs is, he needs to have a job where it's not too chaotic. You see, well, that's the thing. And he had worked several jobs, um, and one of his jobs was the the soul of chaos. He worked for two years at Halloween Horror Nights as one of the scare actors, and it was the soul of chaos. Um, and he he got through that, but he got through that. But they, but I'm thinking, you see, the other thing he t he's kind of a word person. Yeah, you know, I talk a lot about the visual fingers, skilled trades, uh, art, mechanical stuff, mathematicians, computers, music. But the word thinkers, where they can be good, is what I call quiet, specialized retail. Mm. This is where, and there have been a lot of successes in this, where they're appreciated for their knowledge of the new cars on the lot. Mm. Every new car on the lot. There was a 12-year-old who used to sell cars. He was allowed to demo them in park only. <laughs> I and, love that. Um, he was selling new cars at a family dealership. He wasn't allowed to take them out of park. I love and then they go for the test drive, and then he's in the back seat explaining all the high, all the electronics. But there's been other successes where autistic people have uh, been very good at selling new cars. Another thing was specialized business insurance. That's been another successful business. Interesting. Sporting goods, helping someone pick out the right baseball club, selling phones and phone plans, helping people to pick out the right phone and the and not the most expensive thing, the right thing. A bank, I did a Zoom call with a bank, and they'd hired two or three autistic people to sell high-end financial products. I so you love can, this. Again, knowledge of a specialized product. Yes. And they don't try to shove the most expensive thing down people's throats. You pick out the right product for that person. I love it. I call that. it quiet, specialized retail. Love You're working that. with one customer at a time. That's amazing. And those things have actually been very successful. Those are specific examples. Well, now you got me thinking. Now, in this new edition of this book, and for those of you just turning tuning in, we're talking about uh, Temple's newest edition of her book, Developing Talents, Careers, uh, subtitled Careers for Individuals with Autism. 
Um, you added some new things to this edition. Uh, well, Kate Duffy, since she's a professional job counselor, she updated all of what's available in government programs. Yes. She completely updated that part of the book. That's what she did. And that alone is worth the, getting the book. And, and that, that was she completely updated that stuff. But there are and also a couple of new chapters. Yeah. And, and she updated that. And then I uh, added some stuff on the on the different kinds of jobs. I really emphasized the pilot's checklist because not having checklists has caused a lot of people to lose jobs. But you because also... I cannot re remember long strings of yakety yak 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 sequential information. Yeah. Well, I used to be able to. I can't anymore. Um, but you also added a chapter about entrepreneurship. I can't even say that word. Being an entrepreneur. Well, that's important because yeah. I know autistic people that started out small welding shops and they just started doing little jobs for factories and then they like them and then they do a bigger job and then next thing you know, they're building the whole plant. Yeah. You see, that's entrepreneurs. There's been a lot of um, successful things with that uh, and doing something specialized. So I had a mom ask a question the other day, and I said, I, I'm going to ask this of Dr. Grandin. Uh, she said, my teenage daughter is frustrated most of the time, especially with me. She's very motivated by money, but since she is only newly a teen, she is not eligible for a job. She's 13. Uh, someone recently suggested entrepreneurship. I can't say that word. I have a hard time. And to be honest, that had not occurred to me. I wouldn't even know where to start. Will this book help me? I would start with something like walk a dog walking business. Okay. Just something like that in the neighborhood. Okay. And she can make some money doing that. I, That's the kind of thing. You know, offer up her services to, to help with, with stuff like that. Something just in the neighborhood that she can make some money uh, at. I just don't think that we can overstate the importance of how empowering it is when you do something and get paid for it. Well, that's right. I remember when I when I worked for the seamstress, started out as unpaid, but she, she said I did such a good job of taking apart dresses and hand hemming them that she started to pay me. And then I went out and I bought some striped shirts that I loved and my mother hated and she lost them in the laundry. <laughs> I, I like striped shirts. Amazing. Uh, I, I'm so glad that you got to buy them with your own money, and I'm sorry. I bought them with my own money. But your mom lost them in the laundry deliberately, oh, I think. They got lost eventually. <laughs> um, but I really, you know, I really liked making some money. It's And she decided to pay me because I was really a help to her. And that's so empowering. It's empowering to feel valued. It's empowering to feel like you did something well, that was really good. But it's also empowering to go buy what you like. Well, that's right. And the thing is, it this was something in the neighborhood. Yeah. Like, um, there's a seamstress here in town that works out of her home. Same sort of thing. Yeah. And you just find something like, or maybe help out at the farmer's market. There you go. Help set the tent up. I mean, you just see set these things up in the neighborhood. Absolutely. Instant they're legal and get real jobs. Yeah. But these things can be and in the rural areas, people will say, Oh, well, I can't find anything. Actually in the rural areas, if they could end up working in the local store and it'd be just fine. Yeah. Or you know, finding well, things in the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, one of the things you talk about in the book is the difficulty with executive functions, that it can be difficult for those on the spectrum and that and that starting a job that sometimes confusion can occur uh and you talk a little bit about how to deal with that feeling of confusion do you want to talk a little bit about that well let's start off with you got to get there on time yeah yeah mother taught me see i one problem that some people have on the spectrum is getting work on time that was not a problem for me being on time was pounded into me some of that was 50s upbringing yeah you know i had an alarm clock i knew how to set it so being on time wasn't an issue um, you know, we use this, we throw this term executive function around. I want to break it down into what the specific problems are. Being on time, not getting things started. Okay, the way I get writing done is I said, well, this block of time is I still need to do this now. When I'm home, I'm going to just write in the morning. From 8 in the morning until lunchtime. 
2012. And are you able then to just do that? Yep. You I can procrastinate. Do I can do that. That's right. But we need to break it down. You see, you see the problem with saying executive function, that's overgeneralized. You see, verbal thinkers tend to overgeneralize. Yeah. Let's talk about each specific thing. Let's say I'm thinking about, let's say they're not getting up in time for work. Well, then you get a really loud alarm clock and put it on, on the other side of the room. So you're <laughs> going to have to get up to shut it off. You see, I just see that. It's something simple you could do. Yeah. Because they got to get up and get to work on time. Yes. Got to start with the basics. Absolutely. You also um, have a whole chapter on sensory issues and accommodations. And uh, the question that we had was, do you require any sensory accommodations at your workplace? No, I don't. But I still, for any task that involves sequence, I need a checklist. I have to write it down. Okay. And when I get driving directions, I put them in a, in a checklist format. I hate it the way the old map quest did it as a narrative hated map quest do you I want bullet points yeah each turn and, have, and approximately how far in between the different roads i have to go on do you ever use any of the ones that talk to you when you're driving now no i hate that i hate that what i what i normally do is i get google maps up and then i make my own little map and then i write a checklist down of each turn Okay, it's 10 miles on I-25 to exit number such and such. Go west on that for about five miles. Uh, I don't have to have the exact distance, but I want to know, is it five blocks? Yeah. Five miles? I want to get some idea. And I make myself a little map, and I make myself a checklist. I'll Google Earth of stuff. I don't like that thing that talks to me. It doesn't sometimes tell me soon enough. Yeah. I actually hate it. Yeah, I don't and like so it when, when it I, talks to so me. So when I have to drive... I go on Google Maps and I make my own little map and then I make my uh, a checklist, like a pilot's checklist of yeah. turns. The I name of the road, right on Green Street, two miles, left on, you know, Pine Tree Street and just making up names of streets uh, for yeah. a half a block. I wonder, I mean, I don't like it when it talks to me either, but on Waze, I don't know if you know this, on Waze, it, it, it shows you a screen and it shows you all of those turns. Yeah, no, it does that on the other ones too. But uh, I, I want to have the, I like having my route mapped out before I go. There we go. There we go. That's what I like to do. Yeah. I, I found, and that's what I do now. I have to drive to downtown Denver, which I hate. I, I, um, I make, and I used to draw a little map and, and then I look at it, I'll, I'll uh, Google Earth it, look at the buildings. Amazing. I like that. I'll do that before I go. Yeah. And then the only thing I have have that to look at is just the the checklist for each turn. Got it. I like that. I look at. Identity is such a big topic right now. Um, and, and there are so many people in so many different camps about how to identify um, but I know we had a conversation with you about identifying with work and I want to know, I want you to tell folks, what does your work mean to you in terms of your identity? Well, I'm a, I'm a university professor first, autistic second. No, I, what I have found that the autistic people, especially some of the ones that I know are undiagnosed, you know, what made their lives interesting was having, they had good careers yeah. and that made them, their lives interesting. And then where the autism diagnosis later in life helped was with their with their relationships. I had a lady come up to me at the Denver airport and go, oh, your book thinking and pictures saved our marriage. Now I understand my engineer husband. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, career is basically my identity. Yeah. And when you think about it, a lot of last names are names of jobs. Yeah. Cook, Baker, Carpenter, Smith. Those are all names of jobs. It's critical. It's critical to who we are. Why would we think it would be any different for our kids? Um, you also give so many examples and real life stories in the book of people who found their way to meaningful employment. But th what that made me think about was, because role models are so important, but as someone on the spectrum for employment, you really didn't have a role model. So what inspired you was it just always a thing that you knew you were going to work? Was that just from the time you were little that you knew you were going to have a job? 
or what inspired well, I did the, let's look at the things I did before I did the sewing job mm -hmm. then I got kicked out of high school and went to a special school was not interested in studying so they put me to work running the horse barn mm -hmm. for three years went to a very expensive school of horse barn management mm -hmm. cleaned out nine stalls every day put them in and out fed them I did everything in that horse barn except the financials I didn't buy the feed mm -hmm. and I learned how to work and one of the things they used to bully me with is they called me workhorse mm. when I'd walk down to the barn to, to take care of the horses. Coming and I loved company. being responsible for the horse barn. Yeah. That was like my horse barn. But do you think, you know, I'm going to evoke Joanne Laura, from, you know, who started Autism Works Now. And she always used to say that she said part of the problem that she saw is that People walk up to kids all the time and say, what are you going to be when you grow up? And that she saw that they weren't asking little kids on the spectrum that. They were saying things like, aren't you smart and aren't you cute and whatever, but they weren't asking them, what are you going to be? Well, I th I'm a big believer in exposing students to lots of different things. And, okay, I just talked to mom the other day. Their school is going to take out music and art. Well, how, do you, how can a kid find out if they're going to be good with musical instruments if they're not exposed? Well, I tried them. I couldn't play them. Yeah. But another kid's going to take the little flute that I couldn't play and take off with it. You may become a musician. How did I get in the cattle industry? I was exposed to it as a teenager. You see, first of all, for careers, you've got to get exposed to stuff. And I'm concerned today that too many kids aren't exposed to enough stuff. I can tell you, video game designer, that's going to be taken over by artificial intelligence. Mm. Car mechanic, someone's still got to fix stuff. That's not going to go away. Are you reminding me that years ago uh, there was a job fair and it was meant for college students, but I took my 10-year-old son and somebody was like, what are you doing? And I said, Temple Grandin says to expose them to things. So, I, And you know what was fun? was that there was there was a guy who was doing a welding demonstration there because they were looking for welders and he let my 10 year old son weld his name onto a piece of metal and you know that ignited an interest in him so you see that's exposure yes and it was done you know and make sure everything was done safely and yes and he was right there and make sure he held the um held the welding uh, welding rod correctly and it but you see, you've got to expose kids to interesting things to get them interested in interesting things. Absolutely. All right, I've got, got to, I got some and questions. I got interested in cattle because I got exposed to them as a teenager. Yes. Yes, but in the book, you talk about the fact that when your mom told you that you were going to go spend the whole summer, you didn't want to go. I was scared to go. Mm -hmm. So she gave me a choice. I could stay for one week or all summer. And that decision would be made after I got out there. Yeah. I was scared. You see, being scared of new things. Yes. The choice was one week or all summer. And I got out there and loved it and stayed all summer. And, and you said, even though you didn't want to leave your favorite program, your television program. Yeah, that, it was a stupid, a stupid TV show. Uh, yeah, and then the, um, they didn't have, well, then they did have TV. And then the day that that show came back on, they had a power failure. <laughs> that was the universe talking to you. Um, but I, you know, I think we can draw some parallels because I know there are parents. I certainly, the first time that my job, my son was going to have a job all summer, I was like, he's going to work for two days and he's going to hate it because he's going to miss being away from his computer. He loved it. He loved it. I think we can't presume ahead of time. We have to let what, them. What try. was the job? He was working as a camp counselor for the Ed Asner okay. family center camp. Working. Oh, let's well, have a more social job. But you see, but this is where I, I want to get this transition to work done, ideally, before they graduate from high school. Yes. But again, it's never too late. There's been some successes with five or six young adults addicted to video games, gradually switched over to car mechanics, and one of them ended up fixing trains. Another one redoes classic cars. And I asked them, how come they gave up the video games? Do you know what they said? Motors are more interesting than video ah, games. There. But how many motors do kids, you got to expose them to them. But you have to expose. Yes. And then I just talked to another family. Their 13-year-old gets to go to the local shade tree mechanic and help on fixing cars. Amazing. And it's just a little local, you know, independent 
backyard shade tree mechanic. I love it. I got a couple and of questions from parents. There. Um, so somebody wrote in and said, my 20 year old daughter is not motivated to do anything. How did your mom get you to do things? Well, uh, exposure, I can't emphasize how important exposure is. Uh, you got to expose kids to interesting things and then mentoring. Like you take Michelangelo, he was probably autistic, grubby little 12 year old dropped out of school. And he was running around looking at great art. These churches were commissioning and they started making stuff. And then, and then somebody saw his talent and pulled him into a studio and apprenticed him. Mm. But I think we have to realize that as a parent, you're going to be the one that's going to have to be looking for who, who can do that kind of stuff. Well, mother did that. And, yeah. and uh, the sewing job and then the opportunity to go to the ranch came up because she got remarried and it was my stepfather's sister's ranch. And she says, oh, that's going to be a great thing for Temple to do. So I think, I think my takeaway from today is instead of hovering over them, we need a new job, and our new job is finding a place for them to go and learn things. Exactly. So we can take exactly. that energy and put it into something else. And we've got to learn uh, life skills. I mean, I'm, I'm appalled at the number of teenagers who are fully verbal, who have never gone shopping by themselves. Yeah. And I'm appalled. I mean, even as much as I've talked about this, I'm still finding them today. Yes. Well, I think we're all a little guilty of this, uh, myself included. I'm going to include myself in that. Uh, but it inspires me when I talk to you about it. I got another question here. My 19-year-old son does not want to be stigmatized, so he refuses the label autism and everything that comes with it. I feel like he is missing out on opportunities. He is going to a local community college and doing okay with no supports, but there is not, no plan for work after. Should I let him just focus on school and worry about work later? Well, I'd like to have some work before he graduates. So this summer, we're coming up on summer now, would be a good time for a job. Yeah. And take a little vacation from school. So we're not making a sudden shift from school to work. And then I know, then the thing won't ask, what's he majoring in? And I don't know. They didn't say that. Don't know. Okay. But I think I would recommend a summer job for a 19-year-old that's going to community college. But to be clear... That sending them out and saying go apply for jobs. No, maybe, no. I think we need to, in the beginning we need to we need to open the back door for them. Yeah. You see, because mother did that with the sewing. Yep. And she did that with the ranch. So talking to friends and friends yes. and friends and saying who's hiring. Yes, um, and 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 just maybe little local shops, things in the neighborhood that they you can put them in. So that's what mom needs to be looking at. That's what mom needs to do. I think it, I, I, I think so as interview stuff, especially in the beginning, let's just open the back door for him. Yeah. Now I'm seeing the back door of some shops right now. <laughs> I love Actual it. Actual back doors of shops. There we Of course, because you're visual. That's yeah. what you're. Okay. Next question. My son is seven and we are struggling with school. He wants to build things, and there is very little of that at school. I have just enrolled him in an after-school robotics program. Hopefully, Good. hopefully Good. that will help him fill his need to build. Uh, they say he takes apart everything in the house to use as parts to make robots. But their question is, should I be doing something about school or just let that be for now? Well... He's in the robotics class, so that is going to give him a chance to build things. Yeah. At least that robotics class is available. Good. I'm glad that you were able to do that. That was the right thing to do. That's and after it sounds school. like he's thriving in that. Well, we hope that. But her question is, like, and I know a lot of people like this, and you talk about this a little bit in the book, that school is hard for our kids. Sometimes it moves too slow. Sometimes it's inscrutable, like it values things that aren't of value to them. How much should we worry about that? And if, and if let's assume, because I, I think this. Well, it depends upon how bad. I've heard four horror stories in the last month mm. on elementary school kids that are really, really smart in math being forced to do the same baby math over and over again when they should be given an algebra book. Yeah. And then he'd be given the old-fashioned algebra book that's numbers, not this kind of wordy kind of math stuff. The old-fashioned um, numbers algebra book and just let him work with it. 
and they turned into gigantic behavior problems and got labeled a pathological demand BS disorder. Um, this is just in the last month. Mm. One in the UK, three in the US. Mm. I have heard these horror stories. Yeah. And they need to be moved ahead in math. Because you take Katherine Johnson, the famous mathematician, did the NASA calculations. Her math education was handled right. It wasn't shown in the movie, but books showed. And she was moved ahead in math very rapidly. Yeah. And the it's good, like in this situation, this kid's got this robotics class. Yes. That's good. They found that. Well, you're because the one who turned me I on think to Khan the, Academy. I, you see that robotics class? You know, then you can show them how something at school they learn they got to use in robotics class. There you go. You you and it starts to make it relevant. You really helped me because you told me because my son was struggling with math, but he could do the more accelerated math, and so you had me get him on Khan Academy, and he learned how to do how to code computer animation, which was huge on Good. Khan Academy. And and Khan Academy is free. Yes, which is amazing. There's Absolutely. a lot, and there's code.org is another one, code.org. Oh, I don't think I Learning know. programming. Any other goodies you want to share with us? Um, well, there's all kinds of interesting stuff with citizen science, with National Geographic. Okay. NASA uh, has a lot of really interesting educational materials. Wonderful. And don't use NASA.com. That's a nasty website. Oh. Just Just type in NASA, and it'll take you to the right one. Okay. NASA.gov is the actual address. All right. We're 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 running out of the time that we have you. I okay. want to make sure that everybody knows that um, all of your books are available. You can get them at all the major booksellers. Uh, the two that we talked about today were Different Kinds of Minds and the newest edition of Developing Talents, uh, Subtitled Careers for Individuals with Autism. Do you have that one there with you that you could hold up for us? I don't have it with me. I, okay. I'm, we will we'll add should a have had, I should have had it here. That's okay. And uh, it's available. Amazon's got them. Also, a local bookstore, if they don't have it in stock, can order any book. Yes. They've got a computer there where they can look them up. And any book you want, you can order from a local bookstore. You can also order direct from Future Horizons. Which yeah, just- yeah, you can get things from Future Horizons on – you know, and Developing Talents is a Future Horizons book. Yes. So you could buy it on their website, too. And that's FH for Future Horizon. I think it's, it's FH. It's FHautism.com. Yes. Um, and you're doing a lot of speaking um, stuff with them. I encourage people to go to your website um, to see where you're speaking because... Well, and I also have tons and tons of videos online. Yes. You oh. can find a lot of a lot of my talks have been videoed. And you can find a lot of stuff online. We have a whole playlist of our our interviews with you. Um, people can check on our YouTube channel. Yep. But I um, but there's really good information on your website too. But I I want to say to people, it's so lovely to talk to you in this way and for people to see you in this way. But there's nothing like getting to meet you in person. Every, I, everybody tells me that all the time. I experience that. So I encourage people to see where you're speaking and find themselves there. You are so open and accessible when you speak with people. I think, um, really uniquely you're, you, you're a superstar. And yet I also just, um, you know, I'm a very practical person, very, very practical. Also, I just see it. You know, I can see, um, okay, the farmer's market. We have a farmer's market here. And I can see just going in there and, like, um, having my kid help out one of those vendors every every weekend. Absolutely. Help them put the tent up, sell the stuff, take the tent down. What a great idea. Yeah, you see, and it, you see, now I see it. I drive by that, and I'm going, well, that's a place I would go and try to offer up my kids' services. Yes. I love you know, how your brain finding works. stuff in the neighborhood they could do. I love how your brain works. You're a great problem solver in our community. Um, it's amazing what you do. I well, I, it's just I just see it. Also, everything specific. You got to take executive function, for example, break it down into where there's a problem. Being on time, can't get work started, disorganized. Well, then you make a calendar where you, you know, you're gonna put aside this time to do your homework. Yeah. 
You can have it before dinner or after dinner, but you're going to have to set some time aside to do that and have it on a calendar. Yeah. I still use a, a cal- like print out a calendar where I've had the whole month there. And then I got, okay, if I'm flying east, I got to have a blank day before the event because with the two-hour time zone change, take a 10 o'clock flight, that takes up a whole day. Well, I have to have a – I'm visual, too. I have a big calendar on my wall, and I have a paper planner still. I have my calendar online, but I have a paper planner still. Do you still use a no, paper yes, planner? Oh, yes, mine's all paper. Yeah. And then you go on a job site, construction site, they'll have the big paper thing all along the wall, scheduling the subs, and they yeah. had it with a movie. They had, like, papers all along the wall of different scenes they were going to shoot, and I'm going, it looks just like a construction site. Yep, absolutely. Oh, there's still a place for just the paper stuff, but I like seeing the whole month. I hate a calendar where it's a page in a book at each day. And I don't, you know, even on a computer, I don't like it. I want to see the month. Yeah, you can't see the big picture. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Exactly. Especially when I got to arrange travel. Absolutely. I got to let you go. Or you're going to be late for the next thing. But can I call you later? I have a question for you. What's the question? Well, th- somebody has, th- that I love has reached out and said that there are two events coming up in Colorado that they would love for you to to come to and I said uh, you know when are they are they real right away there's one in May and one in June they're probably booked all right well uh yeah may, can I call you later and ask you yeah you can call me later yeah okay. that'd be fine okay you're amazing thank you so much I appreciate you and and everything well, it's been great to talk to you and and I uh, have a great day find these Work, exp- no, work experiences in the neighborhood. Yes, uh, yes. And I know this is happening, this will air later, but I hope you enjoy the eclipse today. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm going to get over to school right now yep. before they run out of parking. All right, take care. Thank okay, you so I much. Will. Okay, great. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, the amazing Dr. Temple Grandin. We, um, as I said before, this show is pre-taped, but if you guys have written in questions, I, I promise you at some point we will make sure that we get those questions to Dr. Granite or have her answer them the next time we have her on. I want to talk about the rest of this week and next week and everything that's going on. Tomorrow, uh, we are, we have Jen Barreto. Jennifer Barreto is going to be here with us and she is a autism expert. Uh, specializing in challenging, severe challenging behavior, including self-injurious behavior. So uh, it's a difficult conversation, but we hope that you'll join us then. Then on Monday, we have the amazing Lisa Ackerman, the founder of TACA, the Autism Community in Action, is going to be with us talking about new trends, things that you'll want to know, things that are coming up for TACA. Uh, You won't want to miss that hour on Tuesday, we have Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet, and I believe that we are ta- – I don't remember what we're talking about on, on Tuesday. I'm, I'm just not going to fake it. It's on our schedule. Look on online. But then on Wednesday, another wonderful autism expert, Marcy Fibro, is going to be with us live talking about autism in the school, things you need to know, how you might gauge whether your child needs a one-to-one aid, and what assessment you would ask for to be evaluated for that. Then on Thursday, Jen Yakos is going to be here with us. If you're interested in learning more about autism and what are some really new ways that people are finding out about autism training for you, your babysitter, your camp counselor, you won't want to miss that hour. And then on Friday, a week from tomorrow, for the first time ever on the show, we're going to have Christine and Abby Romeo. You know them both from Love on the Spectrum. They, uh, Abby is one of the featured stories. Uh, she and her boyfriend in season two of Love on the Spectrum US go to Africa. It's amazing. We're going to talk about mermaids and lions and Abby's wonderful hats and what it's like being on a hit Netflix show where it's, uh, it shows you dating the person that you care about. So we'll talk about all of that. Uh, a couple of other little things that I, I want you guys to know that, uh, and, and hopefully I've said this to you many times, but 
they are casting right now for the next season of Love on the Spectrum, and they're looking for uh, some new people. They are particularly looking for women, and uh, they are looking for um, people who are interested in dating. So if you're interested in that, write into us, and we'll get you connected. Uh, as it were. So uh, thank you guys so much for being here during this really wonderful hour with Dr. Grandin. We'll see you tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, Make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.